Welcome. So today we're going to be covering, we, we've done a little series of uh, show control events, um, and this is the final of those, and this is covering uh, open sound control. Um, open sound control is uh, really, really flexible. Um, it has a lot of potential, um, and, and Hans is going to take us through um, sort of uh, uh, what uh, OSC can do for you, right? So uh, I'll cover really quickly what OSC is. Um, but then Hans is going to dig into the nitty gritty of uh, commands and arguments and messages, um, making sure that EOS is set up for proper communication, um, getting uh, inputs and outputs and messages dealt with. Um, we're going to look at some real world examples that, um, that OSC is used on a daily basis that you may not even be aware of. Um, and then uh, Hans has been kind enough to put together uh, a bunch of demos for us just to sort of see how easily stuff can go together. Um, so, so that should be fun. Um, as always, uh, feel free to use the Q&A box to, to chat us some questions. Um, we have some question breaks built in, but we'll, we'll dig in and uh, try and get you answered um, as, as time permits. So moving straight in, uh, first and foremost, what, what is OSC? Uh, OSC stands for Open Sound Control. Um, and it is a uh, protocol that's, that's been developed for multiple industries, right? Uh, so it's really designed to be uh, flexible, customizable, um, uh, and to give you a lot of um, uh, breadth in, in what you can accomplish, right? So, um, you know, MIDI had been a uh, uh, interdisciplinary communication protocol for a very long time. Um, but, uh, but it has a lot of limitations to it, um, and, and technology has evolved such that um, finding something that was um, uh, much more uh, human readable was something that was, was desirable, um, making it very powerful and expandable and, and able to use uh, modern protocols that we use now for networking and, and things like that. Um, so, so that's kind of why OSC came about. Um, and, and EOS has a, uh, a very large implementation uh, of OSC in the back end for you to interact with. Um, so we're going to dive into some technical stuff real quick. Hans is going to clear some stuff up, and I'm going to pass in the beach ball. And uh, Hans, it is your show, my friend. Welcome. All Thanks right. For right. Here. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, so, yeah, so let's dive into some of the nitty-gritty of OSC. Uh, so OSC um, is made of uh, commands. Devices are sending OSC back and forth, um, and the basic kernel of it is uh, an address pattern. So you have an address pattern that says, you know, uh, it's just a string of text that says, hey, I want you to do this, and then you can add zero or more arguments after it. Um, the patterns are completely defined by the control software you work with. Um, so all of EOS's OSC patterns are slash EOS slash something. Um, and the great part about that is in contrast to, say, MIDI, um, love MIDI, done a lot of MIDI, but um, in contrast to it, uh, it's not just numbers that you're trying to remember what the order is. It, it actually, for the most part, makes sense. Like EOS uh, command line equals this. And you can look at it and say, oh, hey, I bet that is the EOS command line, and it's going to be this value. Um, some examples here, uh, EOS slash EOS Q one fire color source uh, uses the CS uh, abbreviation, or, and then hog, starts with hog, playback go. Everything has just a slightly different flavor, but that's the idea. It's extensible. Everyone who does OSC um, can make their commands match what they want to implement. So then we have the patterns. So those are just the basic commands. And then you can add arguments to that. And arguments give extra data. They give extra parameters. For some examples here, um, there are many types. So the controller you use will tell you what types to send. The basic idea is you can send all kinds of data. OSC gives you a couple pre-built-in types, but then there are ways you can extend that. Integers, so just whole numbers, floating point numbers, uh, OSC time tags, so the number of fractional seconds since January 1st, 1990. We've got to get some, you know, we're going to we're gonna do some computer science nerdy stuff here. You know, we're going to gonna really uh, get specific here. Uh, OSC strings and then OSC blobs. And once you get to an OSC blob, which is one of my favorite words for a group of data, 
you can really send anything. You can send JSON data. You can send images. You can do all kinds of things for the most part. And what we're going to be talking about today are going to be just integers, floating point numbers, and OSC strings. And those are really powerful already. So what makes an OSC argument? We're going to look at some examples. EOS has a command uh, slash EOS slash Q slash fire. The argument is one, and in that context, all it adds up to be is just run Q1. Uh, there's a lot of documentation out there for ways you can extend that, ways you can expand that. You can add list arguments, all kinds of things, but we have a very basic command. Color source, uh, to run a Q in sort of a similar context, you do slash CS slash playback, and then you send three arguments, 12 for the playback, fire for the, the verb or the action you want to do with it, and then one, which would be sort of a button edge. Uh, we're going to run into edginess a lot as we talk about buttons. And edge just means whether the button is, or the switch is engaged or disengaged. So the, when, you, uh, when you press a button down, we'll call that the down edge, and that'll be like represented by a one. When you release the button, it'll be a zero, and that'll be the up edge. And then we have another example from Hog. Um, the, we can say hog hardware fader zero uh, and set it to 127. Uh, this is something where it's using an 8-bit number, so which means we're going to send a value between zero and 255. 127 is right there in the middle, so that'll end up setting that fader to be 50%. So OSC messages, when you enter arguments in the software, it's really going to change based on how, what kind of platform you're using to send it. I gave a few examples down below, uh, a few applications. One is Touch OSC, which is an application you can uh, use to create OSC layouts and then put them on a tablet and, and interact with it that way. EOS Magic Sheets even has a little bit of OSC support, or a lot of it OSC support. And then OSC Widgets as well. We're spending a lot of time in OSC Widgets and talking about that. Um, but each one of those has their arguments packaged in a, a separate way. Though, so you kind of have to look at the documentation and see how they want to put it together. Uh, looking at how this all comes together, um, I think I skipped ahead. We're going to go back. Uh, so how does it come together? Arguments are specially encoded. And that's why you see such a variance in different OSC software, because there is a way that we're going to pack these arguments together so that you can transfer from computer to computer. It doesn't matter what the computer is running, what software it's using, they're all going to understand it. Um, and so we're going to have a special way to put in the address pattern, a special way to put in the arguments, a special way to put in all these things so that it's uh, interchangeable. So the bit of special construction that it has to do is it's going to pack this packet, so the single thing it's going to send, it's going to put a start value in there. It's going to say, all right, how long is this packet? Or what's a special start sequence? Like, it's just going to say, look, here is an OSC packet. It's going to be this long, or just start listening, and I'll tell you when I'm done. It's going to send the address pattern, the EOS text. It's going to send a type tag string, which is just saying, I have this many arguments, and here are the types. And then it's going to put the arguments in there, and then it's going to add an ending tag. For the most part, you don't need to worry about this, except to know that when it comes to arguments, the software is doing a lot of packaging for you. So you just need to know how to tell the software, hey, here's what I want to send so that the software will package it properly for you and it'll make it to the other end. So once you have all that bundled together, then the software has to do something where it has to pack uh, bytes of zeros in multiples of four. So it's putting it all together, it's getting a consistent packet, and it's sending it out the door. Um, so a single OSC command will have the start, it'll have your address pattern, it'll have zero or more arguments, and then it'll have an ending if you're doing a certain variant. I mentioned, and this is sort of a sneak peek ahead, about TCP OSC 1.0 and TCP OSC 1.1. We'll get to that in a second. Just know that this is something we have to consider as we're putting it together. But once you have it configured on both ends, it's just going to click. It's just going to be great. Now, what commands are supported? Uh, since we talked about like how these OSC packets go together, you're really going to want to check the user manual or online help pages to find out what each variant does. You know, what EOS does, what Hog does, uh, what QLab does as you're trying to uh, interconnect the two or figure out what the commands are supported. The great thing with extensibility is that they're changing all the time. 
As someone who works on the OSC implementation at EOS, I can tell you it's changing all the time, so we're adding new commands all the time. And so that's uh, something that, if it's not there now, you can always reach out to us and, and see, um, and also just check the user manual for updates as we as we add things. So with that, that was a pretty deep technical dive. Hopefully, I, uh, hopefully everyone is, is still with us and, and have their coffee. Uh, and yeah, do we have any questions that have come in? Uh, yeah, that was, that was a very good understanding of sort of just like how it all clicks together. So, so thank you for that. Um, the, a question that we had come in from James was, uh, why does EOS use, uh, fire for the OSC command instead of go? Um, in contrast to hog or color source using go, do you know of a reason behind that or? Um, I think it's, I, I'm not entirely sure of the answer, but I believe it's primarily just like, how EOS has structured it internally. Like we, we sort of consider it to be like fire is sort of the action we take internally and that kind of made it out in, in the OSC implementation. Um, generally though, it is, it is go. Um, something else happens as well when we do playback where go, because EOS is a move fade desk, can mean a little bit different than fire. Um, so like fire could also be run and out of sequence queue. So if I, if I say fire Q1000, I'm going to, I may be jumping far ahead in the queue list and actually landing there. But I think semantically, it's just, we had, we, we just made the choice to call it fire and it's just sort of, that's sort of what we had. Yeah, that was going to be sort of my instinct on it was that the, you know, fire is called this queue at this point. Um, whereas go is more of a wherever you are in a key, in a queue sequence, advance to the next one. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that may be some of the differences. So, yeah, we also have like a, a OSC command that is just go, and it's just pushing the go button on the fader. So that also helps differentiate between those two. Yeah, very good. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have come in um, about uh, documentation, um, which which I will answer. Um, uh, yeah, there. Uh, Right now, we don't have a really good comprehensive guide of everything uh, EOS can do, right? Um, so one of the things we're looking at in, in future documentation is having a more comprehensive guide of, um, of what OSC commands are there and keeping that more up to date. Right now, we kind of just are like, here's some examples, um, and you kind of have to figure out a lot on your own. So um, again, if there are ever any questions that you run into, our support staff is uh, is amazing. Phone support, um, you know, Rob and I have offered addresses, so never hesitate to reach out to somebody from ETC um, if you're trying to do something and it, it doesn't seem like you can get it to work. But yeah, we're we're hoping to get that documentation in a better place um, coming up. I would add to that uh, that in terms of documentation and particularly like backward breaking changes, we try hard if we are going to change an OSC command or an OSC response we'll add on to it rather than completely take it away, right? Like there were there were some commands recently where I've added a couple of extra arguments on the end. So you're gonna have, you know, maybe had a three integer response and we added a couple extra integers to give you a range parameter or something like that, or add an extra command that has a different uh, address pattern. So we, we try hard not to completely like take something away without, you know, having some provision for it. So we usually try and just add it to the end or add a separate response or command so that you can get extra function without taking away something that was already there. Yeah, and I think what you'll see throughout this presentation is that, um, you know, OSC can be used as simple little triggers or, or little, you know, bumps of information, um, but it also is a really powerful integration tool um, and, and allows full packages of software to you know, transport information back and forth in and out of EOS. Um, so we try really hard to not break those things, you know, version to version. So. Okay. Cool. Um, that seems like all of the questions uh, we have now. Why don't we go ahead and move on and um, see what else comes. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about setting up for OSC and the ways we can get it to connect. We're going to talk about a number of different ways, and so it can be a little bit overwhelming of just all the options, but keep in mind that you're really just going to find your path through this. And so we're going to talk about a bunch of different options, and for the most part, you're going to be doing just a few of these settings to get everything going. The great thing about OSC is it is a transport independent protocol. There's a, there's a word, 
Um, basically what it means is it doesn't matter, it doesn't care about the pipe you're going to send it down. Um, there are going to be certain choices you need to make about that. But for the most part, uh, you can send it in a variety of different ways, and the OSC doesn't specify how that's going to happen. A few of the ETC is used, and not just ETC, like we're talking about industry-wide. UDP, so this is over Ethernet, uh, sending UDP, sending TCP, and doing two different ways to sort of mark where packets begin and end or mark where a command begins and ends. Because remember, as Nick was saying, we can synchronize with different applications, and OSC allows us to put a binary blob in there, which means the stuff we're sending may be bigger than a single packet. So we may have to span lots of different packets and say, all right, start listening, and we'll eventually tell you at some point when we're done sending, and then we can process that. And then USB serial. Um, this is something you've seen with our light hack, and I'll talk a little bit more light hack in a little bit. UDP and TCP. So uh, for those who aren't familiar, uh, there are two sort of different flavors of the Internet protocol that we use. Uh, one is called user datagram protocol, and the other is uh, transmission control protocol. UDP is a stateless, uh, no connection uh, style of sending information over IP. Uh, this means that it's basically, you can think of it just like you're just shouting on the network. You're just kind of sending it out. You don't know if anyone gets it. You hope someone gets it, but you're just sort of sending data continuously. Um, and there's no guarantee the message reaches the destination. Uh, this is useful uh, in terms of UDP for a number of streaming applications. Streaming ACN uses UDP because we're just sending levels out. If you miss a level, don't worry because within 22 milliseconds, you're going to see another level come in anyway. Um, so this is a really useful way to just keep sending data. Uh, in OSC, you may see applications where maybe you're moving a fader up and down. So if you're moving a fader from 0 to 100 and you miss it when the fader crosses 50%, you probably don't want to process that or wait and get that all retransmitted to go to 50% when you've already received updates for 60% and 70% and 80%. You want to just keep going. You want to stay with the most current. And then there's transmission control protocol, TCP. This is a direct connection. It has guaranteed delivery. And this is really a great way to make sure you're connected to the other side. This is sort of where I prefer to put show control kind of applications for OSC where you know that it's there. If you're going to send a queue go, you don't want the queue go to get lost uh, over UDP. You want to make sure that it got there, or, and if it doesn't get there, it's going to try again and deliver it there because there's no second queue go coming, right? With this, is, this is the single command. I want it to get there, and I want it to execute. And then there are two versions of OSC. These are, again, just how we package that. Version 1.0, at the beginning, we just write, we're going to send a message that is 16 bytes long, and we send it. The other side listens to it and says, okay, 16 bytes, cool, and processes it. And then uh, slip uh, serial line yeah, protocol. I should have looked that up before we started. All it does is it has a special tag that says, hey, start listening. And then at the end, it says, stop listening. And that is sort of a bookend. It's sort of a bookend protocol. The only yeah, other detail in. is because we have two TCP versions of OSC, you have to match them so that the two devices know how to talk to each other. Um, on one side, the device will always listen for a bookend that will never arrive. And on the other side, the device will assume that the packet lengths are very strange because it's trying to read a whole bunch of things and it's never getting it. Um, so that's why you just want to make sure that you, you match those two up. That'll be in the documentation. Um, and it's pretty easy for trial and error. You're not going to break anything. It just, it just won't work. Uh, if it doesn't work, you can try the other setting. Yeah, and I just, sorry to jump in. I wanted to um, mention that what feels like 100 years ago now, um, we did a intro to uh, entertainment networking where we talk a bit more detail about UDP and TCP. So if you're interested in that, that may be a good resource to go back and watch um, to kind of understand uh, a broader scope of these things. But obviously these things are important to um, the way that information gets transported around a network, including OSC. So I'll grab fun. that and post it in the post a link to that in the comments real quick. Oh, great. Thanks, Rob. That's great. Awesome. Thanks. So then we get to, uh, for when we're doing things over internet protocol, we have ports. Uh, you can think of a port, and this is probably going to also be another video, so I'm just going to kind of move quickly through this. Uh, you can think of ports as an endpoint or a mailbox associated with an IP address. We usually write it out as the IP address and then a colon and then the port number. Uh, there are a variety of, of ports you can use. 
However, there are certain reserved ones that you shouldn't use. Uh, there's an organization called IANA, which sort of uh, reserves certain ports for certain uses. We recommend things uh, like ports 8000, 8001. You can choose lots of other ones. When we do architectural integration, we're usually in port 4700, that neighborhood. Uh, there are lots of different options. The key is you just want to make sure that it's a port that's not in use on the computer, not in use on whatever you're integrating with. For the most part, you're going to, it's, it's fairly open because there are a lot of ports available. Um, but just if you're in the port 1 to 1023, that's where there are a lot of applications that are using a lot of ports already. EOS will always be listening, unless you disable it, through TCP connections on port 3032. Um, so that is a place where you can always just go and get a TCP connection. Uh, a port isn't inherently TCP or UDP, and that's something that each application sort of specifies and each application connects to. So as you're looking to integrate with something that does OSC, you're going to want to find out, does it do UDP OSC? Does it do TCP OSC? What port is it listening on? And what protocol is on that port? EOS, for example, will do UDP on some ports and TCP on other ports, and that all goes into what we have in set up. UDP ports are typically configured, and the thing to remember with UDP is because we're just sort of we're sort of just shouting on the network, we're just sort of sending without expecting it to be received or, or knowing if it's going to be received. Um, the receive port is typically different than the transmit port, and so as you're configuring it, you can see that any device can send to the receive port, but you're going to have you're going to basically be setting up both you're going to be wiring both ends of it. So you're going to be saying EOS transmit on this port to this device over here, send it to their mailbox here, and then that device is going to be sending to our mailbox here. And so you're going to have sort of the receive on this end to the transmit on that side, the transmit on that end to receive on this side. And you sort of end up sort of matching them up. And you're also going to have to say, EOS, go ahead and send your UDP OSC out to this one device. Because if EOS receives a UDP packet, it, it really doesn't know where it came from. It just says, hey, this thing arrived on the network. It's going to process it. And when it wants to send a response over UDP, we'll need to tell it, this is the reply address. Go ahead and just send back your answer to this port and this IP address. When it comes to TCP, we actually have two roles, and this makes it a lot cleaner. You have a device that acts as the server and listens for incoming connections. So EOS opens up port 3032 and just says, hey, I'm ready for connections. Just let me know. Other devices will connect to that and start sending requests to connect. Um, and once that happens, EOS will know, oh, hey, you're, you are over here at this IP address. I'm going to open up a session with you. We can reply. We can talk. And so there's no need to wire anything up. Uh, you can just say EOS is doing OSC. This device connects, and now they're talking back and forth. There's no this port to that port, this IP to that IP. It just, it just happens. Um, because EOS is a TCP server, that means that other devices do need to initiate connections to it. EOS doesn't go out and sort of attach to other devices. You need the other devices to be a TCP client that's going to go in and, and make a connection. Another cool part is because EOS knows where everything is coming from because TCP allows that. Uh, device can subscribe to parameters, interact on a separate user. We can respond directly to the device. And this is how a lot of applications integrate. They come over TCP initiate a separate session, they can get data, they can they can have a conversation with EOS back and forth while they're not impacting your command line, they're not impacting your workflow. Uh, with UDP, you can also change the user, but it's sort of one giant shared user session. Everyone's sort of talking at the same time to that. TCP ports are hard-coded. Um, a feature that we are adding soon is the ability to have additional ports. I think we may have actually in, done that in EOS 3.0. Um, additional ports can be added so you can um, specify uh, different ways you can talk with TCP. The real big advantage is maybe you want to connect to an application for setup, so you're doing focus or something like that, and then for showtime you want to cut that off. So you can split it off into a separate TCP port and then disable that or remove that TCP port, and now you sort of have this assurance that nothing is nothing from that focus application is going to be coming in and, and impacting the show data. So I said that OSC can go over a variety of ways, and it can go over an IP network. So that means that, obviously, yes, it can definitely work on wireless. Uh, you can send an OSC over wire to wireless. It doesn't matter. It's going to be packaged over IP, and it will work, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. There's, 
Uh, just some considerations you have to consider as you uh, think about that. For sure, UDP is not guaranteed. So if we're talking about wireless, where lots of things can be transmitting, uh, UDP is more, you're more likely to have packets dropped. If you do TCP, it will guarantee it get there, but it might get there late. So in your application, you have to consider, is this something where I would like to have just a very lightweight protocol, something where I am just going to send some buttons doing focus, and it doesn't matter if it gets dropped, okay? I can do UDP, I can do TCP, it doesn't really matter. Am I also sending SACN or other streaming protocols, which means, like, am I already sending a lot over wireless, uh, which sending ACN over wireless is another conversation, but am I sending a lot of stuff on wireless, so is it more likely that the network is going to get congested or there's going to be more packets and more likelihood of dropping? Am I going through a router? Trick, uh, connection may be trickier to set up. So depending on your application, wireless will work great. Uh, or if you're doing more of a show control thing where you want to make sure that this command must get there, then that would be maybe run a wire, maybe look more carefully at whether you're going to do UDP, whether you're going to do TCP. And then, yeah, I uh, already did that. Okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about setup. Uh, I want to walk through. Okay, Nick. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions that are kind of relevant to what you were just talking about, so I wanted to pop those in there. Of course. Um, uh, before we, we go into configuring EOS. Um, uh, Spencer was wondering, how do you set your OSC command as UDP or TCP? Yeah, so that is going to be, it's not necessarily set up on a, a command level, it's set up on sort of a device connection level. And so that's going to be something uh, that you're gonna configure in the application. So when you do OSC widgets, which is one application we'll be looking at, um, you actually just have a drop down where you can say, do UDP, do TCP 1.0, do TCP 1.1. Uh, so if devices can support multiple ones, you're just gonna kind of set up that up as a property of your connection. Otherwise, it will be just one flavor. Um, I think Touch OSC is, don't quote me on this, I think it's UDP primarily, it may, they may have added TCP. Um, and in those cases, it is just, this is the single flavor and that'll be in the documentation. Excellent. Um, Ryan asked me, I think Rob looked this up, uh, is there a set range for port numbers? What's the highest port number, et cetera? You said that below 1023 is kind of reserved for other programs. Yep. Um, I think it's a 16-bit number, so 65535, I think is the highest port number. Um, and there is a great, uh, there are Wikipedia articles, I think they have to go into like different port ranges. Um, so like w 1 to 123 or to 1023 are, are sort of preset, reserved, then there's sort of a wider range. Then up above that, there's an ephemeral range, which is just like things may come and go, grab, an, grab a port just to use something. Um, so there are, there are lots and lots of, of ports uh, that are available to choose from. I can, I can read from the manual. Uh, I definitely don't have this memorized. Uh, for UDP, uh, we recommend range 4703 to 4727 or 8000 and 8001. And I'll put that in the chat too. Uh, cool. I did not see if there was a separate range recommended for TCP. I will continue to look for that, but I'll put that answer in the chat there. Yep. For, for the most part, TCP and UDP, they're interchangeable. Like, usually if you're going to assign something to UDP, you don't want to confuse it by having something else also be TCP, you know, on a different device. But for the most part, they, you can, you could use some of those as a TCP, TCP port as well. Great. And, and Chad notes that in the wake of the pandemic, we, we should probably replace TCP handshakes with TCP elbow bump. Yes, that's indeed. Uh, that's critical. Indeed. Uh, 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 we have a question here about sort of ACN versus OSC. I'm going to save that kind of to the end. So sure. I got a question, but but we'll talk about that maybe later on. Um, one last one for this section. Um, uh, Stefan is asking if there will be support for TCP client in the future. Um, uh, you're saying that um, some software like QLab also works as a TCP server. So TCP yeah. and TCPS and QLab seems not possible. Do you have any thoughts on on that? Yeah, we have talked, we have talked internally about adding a TCP client option. Uh, so that is something, you know, each side is working on, on new and exciting things, uh, that may be coming to an EOS near you, but no, no promise on, no promise on when. But certainly, yeah, that is, that is a, uh, an issue where, uh, both EOS and Keylab are both sitting there saying, yep, we're servers and they don't, they don't reach out to get a connection. 
Uh, and that's a case where you can use UDP, but then you have sort of the, the drawbacks of UDP like we talked about, or you can use some sort of um, app in the middle thing like OSC router to actually reach out and do those connections. But yeah, that is something that we've talked about, something that I, I think we want to do. We, it just hasn't uh, hasn't come up yet. It's always about timeline. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, one quick one, and then we'll we'll move on to getting EOS set up. Um, if if both sides talk uh, OSC version 1.0 and 1.1, is is there a preferred method? Like which one is is sort of better? I guess if we want to call it that. Yeah. Um, I would say that. OSC 1.1 is probably a better option. I mean, it's the newer protocol. It it gives you a way to just very cleanly say, this is the start of the packet, this is the end of the packet, and and that is that. Is that. Um, otherwise, when you're doing the, the length encoding, you're just sort of, if you get a very long length, or some malformed packet comes in, you're just kind of waiting forever for the, a buffer to fill up before you, before you interpret it. Both work well. Uh, slip is sort of a better way to just sort of frame a packet and make sure you have the entire thing before you process it. Um, Great. So, yeah. Very good. Um, cool. That's all we've had come in for now. So why don't we, uh, why don't we get EOS up and going? Let's do it. Thanks. Okay. So we're going to walk through where we set up various OSC settings. Again, this is a lot of different transport protocols. You're not going to need to configure all of this, but I want to walk through and kind of show you here are all the levers you can move on EOS to change how we do OSC. And OSC commands are the same regardless of transport. Anything you send to us over USB is going to be the same thing you can send to us over TCP, over UDP, wireless. We, it doesn't matter. If you get OSC to EOS, it's going to act in the same way. So uh, we're going to look at the shell and Ta-da, sneak peek at EOS 3.1. We have multiple NIC support coming. Very, very exciting. Um, and what we can do in here is we can set up OSC per interface. So we can specify where, if we're going to do uh, UDP strings and UDP OSC, we sort of open up the port kind of in the same way. Um, and we can uh, check on which NIC we want to use that uh, on TCP. OSCs, this is our designated port 3032, and anything you specify in setup, you can check that. And then there's a global setting for whether we're going to do T. Uh, because I, I work in development, so I'm my, my brain sort of shifts over into the newer version a little bit more more quickly. Um, but the you can check that, and then we'll always when when you have that, we open up a another TCP slip port on 3037. Um, so this is a way that if you have something that you're always integrating with, you can sort of have a dedicated port always open and available for that. All right. Uh, you can see in the drop down here where we choose our TCP format. And then, so that's basically all the shell settings. We can just look at um, all the NICs and configure where we want things to be running. And then we go into setup. So in setup, we have two toggle options. One is for any OSC receiving, one is for any OSC transmitting. So you toggle these off and we'll just say, let's not do any OSC either receive or transmit. For UDP, we can specify here the report, the port we're going to receive OSC over UDP on, so where it's going to listen to. And the same for transmitting. We're going to look at where we're going to send replies. So send it out to this port and send it out to a particular IP address. Since UDP, we don't have an idea of a connection. We don't know who sent us what packet, or we're not keeping track of that. We need to have a specific address to send that back out for a reply. Now, that's also another challenge as you consider integrating with UDP things. If you have four or five different devices that are doing UDP and you wanted them to be separate or get separate data, it's really, it's going to be hard to get all those packets back without something else like OSC router. So that's where TCP really shines is where you can have a whole bunch of things pile in. They can all talk and they all get their own replies. They all have their own little session. And then here's where we can uh, expand and show additional TCP ports. So you can add a, a comma separated list. You can add a few additional ports and integrate with particular applications from there. This is a cool section, too. This is where we can set a couple of quick interfacing strings. 
And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I just want to kind of point out and sort of put a put a bookmark and say, hey, here's where we're, remember that time in setup where we had that send string and receive string option. Um, then we also have a ability to turn on and off receiving from LightHack. So LightHack is where we do OSC over uh, USB, and it's sort of using a serial connection. This is where we can enable and disable those connections. So that was kind of a very quick tour through EOS uh, OSC setup. Any questions? Uh, yeah, a, a good question came in from Don. Um, just sort of uh, talking about these settings um, and, and dealing with a primary and backup situation, which I think is a good little yeah. point. Yeah. Um, that is, I would say that is a, uh, the primary for the most part is going to be where we want to initiate the connection. There is, there are some areas for improvement that we have where uh, we want to uh, look at having a better sort of primary backup failover connection, right? Um, because you're going to want to be connected to the primary when the backup takes over, you're going to want to shift those, those connections over, over to the backup. Um, so that is, yeah, that is a, a, a place where you're going to want to sort of plan that out. Having TCP connections switch, uh, you may also, op you can open up, I believe, you can open up connections to the backup and the primary at the same time and then just fail those over. Um, I don't think you have more thoughts on that, too. Yeah, the, the way that we handle that right now is that um, for the device that's talking to the system, um, you want to talk to to both the primary and the backup. And basically, in a in a normal setting where the, the primary is functional and the backup is there. Backup is just ignoring those commands because the primary is handling them. And as soon as there's a failover um, and the backup takes control of, of the rig, it starts processing those things. So there's just a little bit of um, configuration you need to do on the, the third-party device to make sure that um, that stuff is going to happen appropriately. Um, uh, you know, you'll want to make sure that those settings um, on your primary and your backup are the same, right? So that they can receive and interact with that information um, in the same way. Um, and, and as Hans said, this is a uh, known area of improvement for us, right? Where um, we can make that be uh, a little bit more uh, robust and, and handle that transition and a failover uh, more elegantly. So, um, so hopefully in the future, we will get to that. So. Um, cool. Uh, that is it for that section. Why don't we go ahead and Super. do the next section? And uh, we've got a couple of things that have come in, but I feel like we can talk about them in a different place. So, okay. On. Sounds great. So we're going to dive into sending messages, and this is really where we start to get into the meat of what can I do with OSC. We've talked a lot about here's how OSC gets strung together. Here's sort of all the all the, the gory internals of how it all comes together. And now we can look at what can I do with OSC? Why is why do we have all this machinery? Uh, what does it do? I, card, I sort of group these into different groups. Um, there is implicit output. So this is stuff that EOS will just send without us doing absolutely anything. I connect over TCP and I get a volley of, of information back that just basically tells us like, here is the state of EOS as it is now. And as things happen on the command line, as things happen in the system, we're going to get periodic updates that are, are coming back and keeping us up to date with what's happening. There's configured output. There are things that we can make you send to quickly integrate. Wi-Fi or a queue, I can send QLab Workspace One Fire or Workspace One Go. I can just quickly send a command. I don't have to do a lot of configuration. I just tell EOS, when you're on this queue, send this OSC command. And that's an example of some configured output we can do. There is input. So this is categories of what can I send to EOS or what can I ask EOS to send me? These are things where I can create remotes and do a sort of a focus remote. I can ask EOS to send me what the queue labels are and get those information back. And then configured input. Uh, there are ways that we can specify so that EOS can take actions from specific inputs. We can say, you know, I have someone who is integrating and just wants a particular command. It just wants to send one command to say, do it. I don't know what it is, and we're going to figure it out in EOS, but just send do it. And we can make EOS respond to a command like that. And then the EOS programmer, as you're working there on the desk, you can hook it up to macros, hook it up to whatever you need to make that, to make that action happen. So implicit output. 
when you are connected to EOS, uh, either TCP or UDP, the, the thing is EOS just won't know when you connect, so it's not going to send you that initial burst. You sort of have to listen from the beginning. Automate, you get updates for things like the command line. So as people are typing, you're going to get the command line as it gets filled in, as it gets uh, terminated with the enter, or you see that pound sign. That's one way in, in sort of the show control world that we sort of show that the command is complete. You get parameters for encoders. So we send active wheels. So as you change selections, we're sending you, hey, these are the parameters available. These are the wheels you could send over. You can send fader updates, direct select updates. So as a sub gets labeled, if a sub value comes up and down, you're going to get information about that. We can send show control events. So you're going to know when queues are fired, when macros are fired. Um, and then also show file events. So as we save, as we load, you're going to know what the current show file name is. You're going to see what when it got cleared. And it gives you sort of a peek into the running EOS system. And we're sort of keeping you up to date with various items. All of these are going to be using the EOS slash EOS slash out as the start of the OSC address. So slash EOS slash out. And then it's going to give you whatever update it's trying to send. So that's ways you can sort of filter out and quickly see, okay, EOS is trying to tell me this happened, this happened, that happened. Then there's configured output. You can specify a custom output on a queue by queue basis. So I gave an example here uh, where we just say Q1 execute string slash custom slash go slash one. So now whenever Q1 goes, anything that has OSC connections are going to get that message blasted out. Everything's going to get it, and I can, it's a great, quick, and easy way to get show control out of EOS over OSC. Uh, I can, as a, the Q execute string syntax is the, the particular way as we do it in sort of the way we'd write it in the manual. You can also do wildcard output. This is either in setup for the OSC, OSC Q send string or on a Q list basis, you can customize that. And that's really a cool way uh, where, say, if I have QLab, and in my QLab workspace, I number my Q numbers the same as I do in EOS, I can say uh, QLab workspace, and then sorry, I'm a lighting guy, not an audio guy, but a, um, like slash QLab slash workspace slash one or slash wildcard fire. And that is a way that I can say, oh, EOS fired Q1. It's going to send out slash workspace go one. And then I can match that up on the other side to whatever my cues are. And so that's a really quick and easy way to customize what the output's going to be without having to go into every queue and make, make the same thing over and over and over again, just changing the number. Uh, for configured output, uh, yeah, this is sort of a little overflow of the previous slide. We can have a quick way to EOS to send a custom string. The key difference here is that when you're in setup, you can send, this is for all queues. Whenever any queue list fires, we're going to send this same template. If we specify it on a queue list level, we can just say this queue list is maybe my, my audio synchronizing list, or this is my projection synchronizing list. And I can send, I have a custom string that is particular for whatever that system needs to integrate with. There are a bunch of wild cards, and uh, uh, this is sort of in the slides here. Another way is that in EOS, if you hover over the place where you specify this, we have a little pop-up that tells you all the wildcards you can use. But we can separate things out about queue number, list number, the whole number of the queue, the decimal of the queue, and the label. And you can use that to sort of mix and match whatever your receiving device is going to end up needing. Uh, so a quick example, we could say like slash queue, slash fired, two, three, four, label five. And this is sort of putting it all together. Um, EOS will substitute, which all those numbers, all those percentages with whatever uh, whatever the particular wildcard is and construct that command. And it'll do that on for the entire list and just send that all out automatically. You can also keep it a really simple too. So slash foo and EOS will just send slash foo anytime you want, um, anytime you run a queue. So it can be really complicated. It can also just be really simple. Like OSC is is nice that way, where we, we sort of go between go between two ends and sort of all kinds of shades in between of nice and simple. Send a quick command and give me all the detail and spill your guts. You know, it's sort of it's sort of all all between all that. In terms of input, um, we accept a lot of different things. We can emulate the keyboard. So if think that's EOS slash key. We can send levels. So you can see just a quick example of we can send channel one to a level. We can emulate wheels and switches. Uh, so this is just encoders, basically. It's another way of saying that. 
Wheels and switches just work slightly differently. Wheels, we're going to just keep sending a tick every time you sort of move. And switches are like, okay, start moving and stop. Start moving and stop. Um, but they're just two different ways we can use to adjust values. We can send full command lines. This is a really nice, useful integration option. Just like, I just want to label a queue. Great. Slash EO slash command Q1 label blah, and it will take it in. And we can fire macros. Lots of different options. We can talk to record targets. We can select them. We can recall them in live. We can fire them. Um, so groups, subs, queues, pallets, presets, magic sheets, you can really talk to most every object in EOS and, and find out about it, select it, toggle it on. Like you can recall a magic sheet on a console just by sending an OSC command in. And then there are also so user interfaces. We can do configurable user interfaces that are just um, direct selects, faders. We can basically make a, a user interface that uh, we can say, Hey, I have this many buttons, I have this many faders, and EOS can populate them with us, and we can have some interactive control very quickly. And lots and lots and lots more. We also have configured input. Uh, this is the OSCQ receive string we mentioned just a little bit ago. This is a great way to have EOS act on any OSC input. We can say, when you receive this string, go ahead and take an action, depending on what you receive. You can use wildcards for the queue numbers. Uh, it's the queue number and optional queue list. This is a great way where you can say, my device is just going to send slash go slash queue number. And so if you specify that in EOS, EOS will then just fire off the matching queue number. And the same, you can add a queue list in there as well And you, if you have a multiple queue list situation. Our show control list is also a really another great way to do this, uh, where you can integrate systems without them having to know much about EOS. You know, if you're integrating with a bunch of different systems, you could say, yeah, go ahead and send me macro 50, fire macro 50. And then I'm like, wait, did I say macro 50? No, just uh, macro 99, I had to rearrange. Or, you know, it, people have to learn a lot about the internals of EOS. With a show control list, you could just say, don't worry about the syntax. Just send me slash EOS slash SC slash lightning. And whenever you want lightning to happen, I'm going to hook it up on the internals of EOS, and I'm going to make lightning happen. Um, and this allows the integration to be constant. So even if you change your mind about how you're going to do it on the insert internals, the command is going to be the same. Uh, and that's just anything matching with slash EOS slash SC will get routed over to the show control event list tab uh, with the type network. Any of these inputs then, and then you can figure what the action is going to be. And once you hook up to a macro, really, you can do anything you need. Fire off additional macros, fire off time code lists, enable, disable things. Really, macros give you, give you a big opening there, but you could also fire queues, fire subs, any of those things. Any questions about messages? We have a lot of ways to integrate. Um, do we have any, any questions come in? Uh, yeah, there are a few things that have uh, hopped in. Let me see what one makes sense to grab. Um, uh, Stephen is asking, uh, uh, are implicit outputs sent for every connection? For example, if you're using TCP and UDP, what's, what are your thoughts on, on when implicit outputs are, are happening? Yeah, uh, implicit outputs are sent for every connection using TCP and UDP. So if you are connected and listening, it's going to be sending that. However, we do uh, – we added it when we did the light hack. We have the ability to subscribe and filter things. So you could just say, hey, EOS, this is all great, but I really just care about pan and tilt values. Like, just, just only give me pan and information. And then EOS will filter out all of that output that it's going to be sending to you. But for the most part, then, everything else is going to be receiving all those implicit output or updates as they happen. Excellent. Uh, similarly, uh, when you send um, uh, a queue number, execute, send string, is that outputting uh, only as OSC or as string or as both? Um, it, what it does is it looks for what looks like an OSC string. If it looks like an OSC string, if it quacks like an OSC string, it's going to say it's an OSC string, it's going to send it out. Um, so, yeah, it, the, the question is really getting at, like, you use both, you use send string to send both UDP strings just all by themselves and OSC. And so, yeah, if it looks like an OSC string, we're going to interpret it as the OSC string. Excellent. So there's a little bit of... Uh... A little bit of voodoo happening back there. To, yes. To, to hey, don't mention the man behind the curtain. We're sort of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, uh, oh, this is a good one. Uh, is there any ability to send OSC uh, inputs uh, to augment to control things like uh, stick themes being on or saved views or key preview? Do we, do we put any of those integrations in the 3.0? Um, ETC is always working on new and exciting things. Uh, but the, the answer is we have a little bit of OSC integration uh, in EOS that sort of do things. And one of my examples, I'm going to be doing some XYZ positional moves for, for a, a fixture. Um, but I think that's something where you'll see some additional integration as time goes on. Um, yeah, that's, that's my feeling is, you know, we've, we've been pretty open that, um, you know, augmented in 3.0 is sort of a starting point. So, um, you know, Ryan asked the question. I think those are great things to be able to start to integrate um, as we get those requests from the field. So yep, sure. um, always feel free to send me an email uh, or the forums are a great place to, to post those requests as well. So thank you for that. Um, uh, if you send a queue number in an OSC string without giving a queue list number, uh, does it send to all queue lists or just queue list one? Um, I'm going to need to uh, check on that. The the answer is it's it's not going to send it to all queue lists. It's going to do one of two things. It's either going to send it to queue list one or it's going to send it to your master playback. Um, and that can be something that in our live demo uh, we can remind me and I will uh, we'll check it out. We'll see what happens. Play with that. No, it'll, it'll, it'll be great. Be, yeah. It'll be fun. It'll be great. <laughs> yep. Good. Uh, again, we've got a couple of questions that are some specific implementation stuff. Um, I think that we should get through some demo stuff. We'll get to your questions. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let's, let's go ahead and, um, move along to the last couple sections. Sweet. So, um, let's talk about some real world uses for OSC. So these are applications where you may not even be aware that they're doing OSC, but they're already doing OSC on the back end. Uh, and, and they're relaxed to pretty cool implementations. Lightweight six is an example. Uh, Lightweight six will sync with patch. It will get your queue lists. It'll get your groups. Uh, it's got just a really, really good integration with EOS. There's IRFR and ARFR. We use OSC as the backbone for that. So everything IRFR and ARFR does is using OSC on the back end. Um, even Focus Wand as well. So that is, uh, you know, OSC in, in Augmented is definitely um, something that, you know, we're, we're already using that protocol internally. And so you'll, you'll probably see as the, as development continues, you'll probably see uh, more new and exciting things. Uh, QLab, um, this is, QLab is definitely, I mean, I've mentioned QLab several times. It's been a great replacement for MIDI show control. Uh, distance limits, I think, are a, a key way that integration really shines here because you, you don't have this RS-232 connection that you have to do a signal boost or do some weird things to. It's just, you can put it on a network, you can distribute it wherever you go. Um, and then it also gives you a lot more powerful integration between the two. It's not just fire this queue, it's, it's really anything you can you can think of between those two protocols. Uh, for configurable things, you have Touch OSC. It's a very simple uh, and also gets to a very complex configuration. It's an iOS and Android app, and you can configure it on the desktop for what you want things to be. OSC Widgets is going to be where we're spending a lot of our time. That's a um, sort of a side project that came out of ETC Labs. Where we have a GitHub page called ETC Labs where we have some some you know uh, interesting gadgets and, and things that work with OSC and other applications. Uh, this is what I use primarily a lot for troubleshooting and testing, and it's just a great way to, to get things up and running very quickly. There's also OSC Router, another labs project. So if you need to make an OSC Platform X, whatever it is, talk to OSC Platform Y, whatever it is, this can stand in the middle and route packets. It can um, change packets, say, okay, well, this command, just kind of tweak it a little bit and send it out. It's got a lot of uh, powerful integration. And then Lighthack, diving into the world of Arduino. So if you if you like to uh, wire together switches and, and knobs and encoders and, and can kind of conceive of what you want to make, uh, you can use Lighthack and some of the starter files and really kind of do whatever you want to and, and, and make whatever you want to. I know we have the uh, Facebook programmers group and there are a lot of people there who are sharing sort of uh, screenshots and, and pictures of the devices they're making where they took Lighthack and they added some extra stuff. But they said, oh, Lighthack, that's cool, and, and made their own thing just, you know, based on the idea of I can, I can do this now. So there's a lot of cool stuff out there uh, that you can, you can use and then just use OSC as the, the backbone for actually talking to EOS. Yeah, and I, I think one of the good things about Lighthack, the, the intent of it, um, 
was to make it really accessible for people that were were learning. So it's yeah, it's code yeah. everything on GitHub. We do sell a parts kit, but there's also the parts list is available so you can get online. Um, and all the code that you get with it is really heavily notated. So yeah. um, it's a really great thing to like be able to go in and be like, oh, this thing does this, and here's why I have this chunk of code and things like that. So for beginners, it was really completely designed to like be um, uh, very descriptive in, in what the, the setup is. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and echoing that, it is very much with the LightHack kit and the source code that we have on GitHub, you can get up and running, build the kit, just following the instructions, and boom, you have something that works. And then you can tweak and you can you can do things, you kind of incrementally do it. I mean, that's how that's how development works, right? You know, we're just sort of incrementally changing it until we get to that point where we want to be. So um, it's a really great way to dive into that. Um, and then it, you know, sky's the limit. I had a, a few screenshots here of things you can integrate with. There are Python libraries that do uh, OSC. There are C++ libraries that do OSC. Um, and they just make the process of parsing and using OSC messages easier. And then once you have the OSC coming in, you can figure out what you want to do from there. Uh, there's a project called uh, Luminosis, uh, which basically takes in inputs from wherever, and you can kind of hook them up, like literally just like wiring them and connect this input to that output and um, all kinds of fun things or output to input. There's OSC router, which we talked about, OSC widgets, which you'll see a lot of in a second. There's even something called Sound to Light, which is another project where based on it's sort of doing real-time audio analysis. And when your waveform reaches a certain point, it can send OSC messages. Uh, so you can you can hook that up. So um, I did a project one time where I had a we had a game show, and every time that you know you you toss a beanbag and it hit a wood board, that would hit a microphone, and then I triggered it off of the you know the low frequency thing, and that would make a light flash. You know there are there are all kinds of applications there that you can you can integrate, and so there's all kinds of great stuff. Let's do some live demo, um, and. Take a take a dive in here. Um, general structure: We're going to be doing uh, OSC using OSC widgets. I have the URL here. Uh, if you go to GitHub.com/etclabs. Uh, you can see all the various projects there. Look for anything with OSC in it, and that really is our, our OSC collection. I'll be running EOS, and we're just going to start sort of from a simple button, just nice easy button, and then we're going to kind of work our way up through various applications. And then we're going to kind of get to more of an advanced scripting example. I have a couple little demo applications to show about sort of the potential of what you can do uh, with sort of an advanced integration. So um, I suppose before we jump off there, are there any other questions uh, about those sort of things, or should we just dive into our dive into our demo section? Uh, I think there's one that would be good to maybe take up right now. Um, Alan is asking about uh, setting up OSC between EOS and QLab uh, on the same laptop. Um, do you have any sort of recommended? Is there, you know, do we need OSC router? Like, what what would be the best way to kind of set up that on a single piece of hardware? Yeah, uh, I will uh, preface my answer by saying that I know there is a forums post on our website um, that I think uh, Sam Smallman put together that is a really good uh, guide to how to integrate QLab and EOS together. So I would be, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, that page, because that is, that is really useful. Um, on the same device, I believe you're going to need to use OSC router um, to do like a TCP connection. I think you can, if you do uh, UDP, you can sort of have the receive and transmit sort of opposite and they can talk to each other. Um, but I would, I would sort of refer out to that page for a, a much more definitive um, answer on how to integrate those two. And again, if if and when we get to the point of having a TCP client or EOS can reach out and connect, that will become easier as well because EOS will have a way to just connect to a device and and have that have that connection. And, and so the local connection, it'll just bounce to the loopback adapter and it'll be fine. And I see Rob Crane has his search. I expect Excellent. he's going to go look for that article and post it in the comments uh, when he finds it. So, yep. yep. <laughs> Very good. Cool. Um, so let's uh, let's dive into some examples. Let's build some stuff up. Do it. All right. So let's go ahead and flip over, and we're going to end up sharing the screen here. All right. 
So, um, so let's dive in. I'm going to open up OSC widgets. Uh, so this is an application that, uh, again, it's ETC Labs. It sort of opens up and it gives you a number of things. I'm just going to walk through the user interface here really quick so we're familiar with what's going on. Over here, this is sort of our setup section. We can specify the flavor of OSC we want to speak, UDP, TCP, uh, 1.0 and 1.1. We can set the IP. So this is just a local host IP address. This is just on my computer. I'm talking back and forth between applications here. And then the port number. If I switch to UDP, I'm going to have a second port number, so it'll be received and transmit ports. Um, but then I can hit connect, and you can see right away I'm already getting that those implicit replies from EOS. So I connected, and all of a sudden EOS is saying, your user three, here's your event state, here is your active queue, here's Q1, here are all your soft keys, wheels, switches, blah, 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 blah. EOS is just sending us that huge volley of information um, so that any application that's connecting that's really interested in that can very quickly come up to speed. So we're just going to do a simple button. Button, great. So all I want to do here is I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to say edit button. And this is, I will say before I get into all the details, I went ahead in OSC widgets and I've made a few examples for us so to go through quickly, but I'm going to be coding this live. I'm going to be basically like putting in the commands and configuring it live. Um, but it's also very easy to just say, I'm going to make a new button. I'm going to come in here. I maybe want to have two buttons. I want to make it bigger. So these things that I'm doing here that are pre-configured are also very easy, but the actual OSC configuration I'm going to be doing live just so we can we can look at that and, and walk through it. So for the OSC output, this is the section where I want to say, when I press the button, here's the command that I should send. So after spending some time in the manual and getting familiar with the OSC implementation, I know that slash EOS slash key is a way that I can send any uh, key events to EOS. So slash EOS slash key slash live. I'm going to make it live. I'm just going to call this button live. And it updates there. And then I have a min and max value. These are the, sort of those edges. So as I press down, it's going to send a one. When I release, it's going to send a zero. So I hit live. It all looks good. If I look back here, uh, OSC widgets will color code the packet. They'll say, hey, you sent this out, and you sent live one and live zero. So those are an argument that I sent out. So now I go back to EOS, where I'm running. I'm going to be in live. But well, that's not very exciting. Sorry, I oh, think no. we lost you for a second. Um, Let me know I'm back. But I think you're back. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. So, um, we have that button. We have to go into diagnostics, and we can also see when OSC commands are being received. Diagnostics. Uh, People haven't opened up before, it's just tab, press old tab and tap 99, and that'll open up a diagnostics window. If you scroll down, there are options to look at incoming OSC and outgoing OSC, and you can get a peek at what EOS is sending and receiving. So as I hit live, you're going to see in here I have an OSC packet that was received for live. So even if EOS doesn't respond to a command, if it sees commands coming in, you can get a, an idea of what it's of what it's seeing at any any given point in time. So that's the live button. I'm going to do add another button. It's going to be a button that will be helpful for us sometime soon. Giant red button. What's more friendly than just a giant, giant red button? Um, OSC output. I want to make a EOS key clear command. So this is a command where I can just clear, basically just hitting clear on the keyboard. If I say one, two, three, four, clear, clear, clear. I can send clear in. Uh, I can also go in and change this command to be EOS clear command line, and that can also be a useful. So if I just get into a big syntax error, hit clear command line, I am reset. I am back to back to basics. So I'm going to leave these two up here. Get our simple button back. Nice and handy widgets. All right. So. Let's go ahead then, and if we create a macro, uh, macro one, easiest macro in the world, one at full enter, got to love it. Um, go to queue out, and we run macro one. Great, we have a macro that turns on channel one. I can then create 
a uh, simple macro button and fire that. The other thing, which people may not be aware of, is if I create a magic sheet, I can come in here. Obviously, I can create a macro one button, right? And I'm going to have channel one. And so we'll be able to see, aha, channel one, tap pull. Great thing. However, uh, I can also go in and I can make a command button that just does OSC locally in EOS. So I can come in, I can say, be a command button, uh, make the text channel one app full or whatever you want it to be. And then for the command, I can do EOS macro one fire. And then I hit that and quite intentionally, nothing is necessarily happening. I'm hitting the button and nothing is happening. However, if you look over in my OSC widgets tab, what's actually happening is I am sending OSC out. I'm sending EOS on fire outbound. So anything that's listening there is actually getting that command. Magic Sheets has two ways that I can do this. So this is send an OSC command outbound. Send it out to whoever wants to listen. And as you can see with this hover over, if I do local, local colon, this is a special Magic Sheets extension, now I'm sending things internal. You can see how channel one at full just came in. So if I go to live summary, or if I quickly add a bar here to be the intensity bar, I hit that. Now I have channel one going to full. I'm running that macro. A lot of folks will use this if they're going to have magic sheets that are portable. They'll make OSC commands locally, so you're not depending on a bunch of different targets. The buttons sort of stand alone. They're just sort of as is on a magic sheet. And anything you can do over OSC, you can route internally and uh, send that back into EOS without having any other application required. So if there's something that's a little bit tricky to do in EOS otherwise, you know an OSC command for it, just drop it on a magic sheet and away you go. Uh, another example, uh, we can make a number pad here really quick. So if you want to make a focus remote, you could very quickly drop in and make all these buttons, um, EOS key, seven, lovely, um, and we could go through and we can make those. And the keys are honestly pretty easy to, pretty easy to configure. You can, you can pretty much, without me telling you what they're like as you're watching me here, but you can figure out exactly what all those keys are doing at any given point in time. Just a second here. The only thing really fancy about this is I went ahead and did some, some coloring on it. Uh, Remdin is a little interesting as you need a uh, underscore to it, but there's in the in the manual, there's a show control section, and I'm going to open that up in a second here. So you can sort of see those commands. Um, full, extra L just for goodies, and then at. All right. So with that, I have a command line that I can set various things to. So I'm gonna hit live, one at full enter, two full random, boom. I am I am up and running with a number pad. I can drive focus off of this. I can add extra buttons for other things like through, plus, minus, group, all those kind of things. But you can see how very quickly you can get up and running and just start to use use this to do to do focus with. Um, OSC widgets, obviously, if I'm on the same computer, it's not as helpful, but this sort of gives a, a jumping off point. You could configure touch OSC, so you have a tablet that has these commands that you can very quickly run with. Um, you could be running this on a, a client computer or just on any, any PC in the, in the room, and, and you can interact with it there. So that is the, the number pad. Um, and that's all well and good, but actually, what would be really nice, so I have a number pad, what I really want is, I want to just watch what EOS is doing. I want to see what the command line's happening. Um, so I'm going to, I bring up an activity widget. So the buttons are pretty simple. All right, I'm going to hit buttons and let's go in there. Uh, what a command line widget or the activity widget is, is it's a way that it listens to OSC and, and sort of interprets the commands as they come back. So for the label, um, I'm going to say, uh, actually, I'm going to take a look. This is another great example. So let's say that here, I'm gonna say one at full. I can take a look here in my OSC packets 
and I can find what I'm interested in. So say here, EOS is sending EOS out user three command and that command. And I definitely want to watch what I as user three am doing. So I'm going to type that in, EOS out user three command. All right, and now as I enter that, I am up and running with a command line. I didn't have to configure anything with EOS. All I told OSC Regis is, is just listen to this and, and give me a display. So now with these combined, I have a live button, a clear button, one at 36. I'm entering things, I'm, I'm up and running and I can see what I'm doing. At a certain point, I can just close EOS or I can minimize EOS and I can just keep running with this as well. This kind of gives you an example of how, we're, how we can build up and we can add the individual elements that we that we may want. So those are the basics of, of buttons and commands. The other thing we can do, and this is especially useful for if you're just trying things out, um, if you just want to say, hey, what happens when I send EOS a particular command, is we can open a command section. So that's just opening up there, right-clicking, adding commands, or hitting a commands button. And then I can just type in anything that comes to mind. So let's say EOS slash command. So that is our standard send something to the command line. I could say chan3 at full. Send that. And you'll notice a couple things happen. First, channel3 at full doesn't get terminated on the command line. And the reason is that I didn't add a terminator on the end of it. So to do that, I'm just going to add the pound sign. And now when I send it, channel3 at full gets processed. Um, the other thing I can do is I can send something like anything to the command line that works in a valid record to you, let's say one slash one, adding spaces, because that's usually a thing. Aha, and it doesn't work. Very interesting. See, this is the thing that's going live. If I add a closing, uh, closing quote, it'll work just great. So now I've recorded Q one slash one and terminated the command line. I have that straight in there. Something else you'll notice is you'll run into times where you say, hey, uh, go ahead and be channel three. I send it over and over again. And if I send another command, it's going to cause index errors. It's going to be, it's going to be no fun. So we have an additional thing where we can say, do we send a new command? So don't, don't care about what happened before. Don't care about what the command line was. Send a new command and now it will overwrite and, and do that. It'll just clear out the command that was before, drop my new command in, and send it. So if you're doing a lot of integration, new command is going to be much better because it's going to just flush out everything that came before. Building on that, because EOS is sending everything about the state, we can also make soft keys. We can make things that follow EOS's soft key state. So let's say I'm going to go in here and say soft key one. All right, soft key two, soft key three, soft key four, soft key five, and soft key six. And the command that I want to send is just going to be EOS key, soft key underscore one. I'll do that for everything here. Thank goodness for copy paste. Makes it nice and quick and easy. All right. And so now I have functioning soft keys. So if you notice, uh, if I do hit soft key six over here, which is trace, trace ends up as a syntax error, but it ends up on the, on the command line there. But this can be far more exciting. Uh, if we do OSC label, we say EOS out soft key one, and we send that through. This is another example where EOS is already sending us these soft keys and their labels. And if we just uh, interpret that in our program as we're reading it. Now we're up and running, and as I hit soft keys, I have all my soft keys which start to get populated. So uh, I clearly mistyped this one. Eos out soft key one two three four. Hmm. Interesting. Well, um, let's figure out what's going on there. Yes, out soft key one. Interesting. We can use over here. We can come over here and look. 
and say Saki 1 is not being sent at all, which is very interesting. We'll have to, we'll have to talk to the developer about that, I think. Uh, so uh, moving on, though, you can see that, uh, tell you what, web conferencing. Okay. So just uh, by listening to the OC label, all these, uh, we can see the soft key labels. We can we can basically use all this implicit output that EOS is already sending us and get a really cool interface. So that is that portion. So building on that further, so we started and we had just a simple just a simple live button. We sort of worked out we got a clear command line button. We can do EOS key emulation. We can watch the command line. We can have another another button, which are just our, our soft keys. We can see those. Uh, we can get labels on those soft keys. We can also do things like emulate EOS encoders. So if we wanted to have some encoders, um, so OSC would just have some encoders, so I can spin it around and move them around. I can go in and hook that up, and I can say I want to talk to slash EOS slash active wheel one. Now, the reason why I say active is that the active wheels are ones that EOS is going to send us to say, these are the current parameters you have for your um, for your fixture that you have selected. So as we have a bunch of, I have an unpatch show, it's not going to be very interesting, but I'll patch a fixture here in a second, and we'll see that we have a lot of, um, a lot of active wheels that we can interact with. Um, and we can do a label of the EOS out active wheel. One, I'm going to copy that. We're just going to do, I think, just a couple of wheels here. All right, so now if I select channel one, it should have intensity. So uh, this is the, always the risk of running it live. Um, so now we have a connection here. This is a great time, almost like I planned this, to go ahead and pop open our user manual and take a look at our OSC implementation and see what's going on. Um, all right, so in our user manual, uh, we have a full section devoted to show control. In that show control section, we have the open sound control section, and we can look in at supported OSC input. And I'm gonna take a look at OSC wheels. Um, so it looks like we have OSC, uh, EOS, wheel, and level. So let's go ahead and give that a try. So this is if I send EOS, wheel, and level, should be able to adjust parameters. Let's try EOS, wheel, level. There we go. All right, so now I am interacting and sending a wheel level into, into the console. Let's go ahead and make it interesting. I'm going to patch a releve fixture. And let's see what we got here. All right, great. So now as I have the releve fixture patch, you'll see that I set this up to have EOS active wheel two, NEOS out active wheel two, and so as I move this, I have pan and tilt that are getting dynamically assigned, and I can move that and I can adjust it. If I select channel two, I'm going to split the screen here, or channel 12, you'll see that it is only showing me the active parameters for that wheel. So when I select the when I select the channel that has enough active wheels, I will end up having control over that directly. Um, there is other supported input. We can have an XY um, area, which is kind of interesting. Um, I can hook this up to be connected to EOS pan tilt XY. So as I select a channel, I'm actually now controlling just pan and tilt directly by having sort of an XY field. Um, and this gets a little more interesting if I go ahead and open up into augmented. So I'm going to take this channel. I'm going to assign it. I'm just going to put it in the space, just put it up about four meters. Open up augmented. Boom. 
So now as I select a channel, this is drived off, all driven off of a command line channel selection, I am moving this fixture around. So that's all well and good, but EOS 3.0 added uh, capabilities to deal with this in XYZ. So let's go ahead and look at a nice quick way to have XYZ encoders and use that in OSC. So I take this, I've actually already configured it. I can select and say, all right, EOS wheel X focus. So this is I'm talking to a particular parameter all the time. So be the X focus, be the Y focus, and be the Z focus. And I talk to that channel. Now I am directly moving in XYZ space. And as you can see in live, as I'm moving that up and down, I'm actually controlling the Z, the Y, and the X parameters directly there. Uh, so this is some of the some of the augmented integration we have, um, where we can we can directly interact with that. I can send XYZ values in directly, um, and and start to start to work with those sorts of things. All right, so just a just a quick whirlwind tour there to some of the basic things. Uh, next up, I just we're going to pause for questions here in a second if we have any, but sort of setting up for the next, we're going to be looking at faders next. We're looking at um, then some some Python and uh, C++ implementations of doing a little bit more more advanced interaction. Um, but yeah, do we have any any questions? Yeah, I think there's some good ones that have come in. Um, uh, can you send more than one command in Magic Sheets? For example, channel one at full clear command wait, like you can with macros, or is that something that you would want to fire a macro to do? I believe that's something you want to fire a macro to do. I haven't done a lot of those more uh, complex local commands. Um, that is, I believe with the actual commands, you can add multiple ones. You can build it like a macro. So you may have the same ability, but I haven't, I haven't worked with that directly. So yeah, and what I'm not, maybe somebody that, that's worked more with this. I don't think we have any sort of weight when it comes to those commands. That's true. You know, so like it, it, I think the system is going to try and send all of that you know, information that you've typed in there all at once and whether the EO software can like get all that work done as quickly as that stuff has been sent is I think probably the problem. Like I think the yeah. thing that will be sent, but um, you know, it, it may not be able to get all those tasks complete. So yep. um, yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about um, using OSC uh, with uh, user zero? Um, and sure. just a quick, oh. like, why that's advantageous and if there are any, like, gotchas, like, background macros and things like that. Yeah, for sure. So user zero is our background user in EOS. It's where if you, if you run a macro in background mode, uh, if you run a macro from a show control event, that all files on user zero. And the whole idea of it is that you're, you're not you're basically, you don't want to interfere with any active programmer. So we're just going to send it to this, this user called user zero. So you can send things out. So you can send OSC commands to user zero. Uh, the only gotcha, and this goes with anything you send to the background user, is that things that depend on your programming state, so like all of our, our key events, all of our encoders, are depending on whatever user zero has on their command line. So other things may be flying in, other background events may be coming in. Um, user zero isn't visible really in the other parts of the system because it's just the background is running background tasks. Um, so you, you, you can use user zero, but it, um, there are just some certain drawbacks. Uh, a lot of times what you may, you may consider is also sending it out to user, to a high numbered user. If you have a designated OSC user and say like user 77 is uh, my OSC user. Then you can have a console that pops into the OSC user to check on what's going on, a console that pops out. It gives you a little bit more flexibility and visibility into, into what's happening. But even if you are on user zero, you can always go into diagnostics and see what all the users are popping in on their command line. So you can always take a peek at, at how things are being processed and how things are run. Very good. Um, a quick one more before we move on. Uh, what is the difference between the EOS slash event and the EOS slash command? Um, and yeah. why would you use one versus the other? That's a great question. Um, so e yeah. So uh, in EOS, we have commands and events. Commands run on the command line, and events are more like sort of show control playback things. 
So certain classes of commands are going to be events. And you're going to get updates based on like, hey, this event happened, or I'm going to I'm going to run this event, and other things actually go directly to the command line. Um, so that's basically the the basic breakdown is that events and commands are, are sort of two two different things. Um, and once you start integrating with OSC, you have to start looking at sort of that that breakdown of whether it's going to go to command line or we're just going to process it as an event. Very good. Um, that is all the questions for this area. Um, we've got about a half an hour left, so we got plenty of time to look at a few more things. Super. Let's talk about some faders here. All right. So faders start to get into an interesting, interesting domain. Uh, in OSC widgets and really in any sort of OSC application, you might have a bunch of faders. You might have 100 faders. You might have a bank that has one fader. You might have a bank that has 28 faders. Um, and what we need to do is EOS needs to know how those faders are organized so that it can start sending you sort of meaningful data on what's going on in the system. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create just a couple of faders. Um, here real quick, I'm going to say one at full, maybe in a, a blue color. Um, maybe I'm going to point it somewhere here, bring up my XYZ faders, right, or my XYZ encoders. Maybe do a little bit of out somewhere. I'm not being very patient right now, am I? All right, let's tilt X back down. There we go, perfect. So. Uh, I have that. I'm going to record sub one. I'm going to go to blind, maybe record another queue, and sub two at full, sub three, three at full, sub four, four at full. Now we just have some subs. Uh, I'm going to go into faders. I'm going to say sub one through four. I'm going to map those. Sub one, two through four. I'm going to map those um, and just drop them in. So now I have four faders all ready to go. And as I bring them up and down, everything looks good. I bring my subs up and down. We have some faders. Lovely. So now what we need to do is I have a fader helper button. Just is called make faders. All we need to do, and this is also outlined in the manual, is I need to send EOS a special OSC command that says, hey, I have faders. I'm interested in some faders, but here's how you should think about these faders. So I'm going to say slash EOS slash fader slash one, fader bank number one, because I may have several fader banks and they may be different, config five. All this means is I have faders. I want you to call them fader bank one, or I'm going to call them fader bank one, too, and treat it as if it has five faders. So now I send that, and now EOS is going to reply somewhere. Oh, I'm way out of there. It's going to reply and say, all right, Super, you have a bank with five faders. Here is what you should know. Fader one is currently at zero. Fader one's range is from zero to 100. Fader one's name is nothing. And it's just gonna go through and list all those faders. So using those replies, I can look back in and I can say, all right, so if I want to send a fader out, I'm gonna send EOS fader one slash one for my level. And my label, if I look here, EOS out fader name, I can say EOS fader one slash one name. All right, so now I have that fader. I realized I was a little impatient. I don't have anything on fader one. We're going to fix that. And now as I bring up fader one, it's going to bring that up and down. I haven't configured the other faders, so I don't see that quite there quite yet. Um, just for simplicity's sake, we'll take these out. Sub one, I can label that uh, releve. And now I have a label on it. And fader one slash one name should be the result I get. Um, EOS out fader one slash one. So this is um, just kind of an example too. Uh, even the pros will get it right all the time, but you can use the tools you have in front of you, and you can um, sort of see the diagnostics and and use those. So now as I bring that up and down, I have a fader fader one slash one name. You figure that, and now I have sub one, releve, and EOS will update me if that changes. Releve two, releve front of house, whatever I want to name it, it is going to uh, update that label dynamically for me. 
the other cool thing is because I'm also sending the fader level out periodically, I could send EOS, I could have a OSC feedback, which just means listen to OSC and update your display based on whatever it's doing. And say EOS fader one slash one, gives out fader one slash one. And now if I bring, of course, uh, EOS fader one slash one, bring this up and down. I knew this was gonna be a little tricky. Apologies. Ah, so you just, we could look at the command here, um, and we can see it's sending EOS fader one slash one. I can quickly edit that. Slash EOS slash fader slash one slash one. And now I'm responding in real time. I have an up to date level. So I have faders that I can interact with this way. I have faders I can interact with this way, and both ends are always up to date. So, um, yeah, uh, I think it's another great example of, you know, use, you, use the tools you have. OSC widgets is really great because it's showing you everything that comes in, regardless of whether it matches what you're doing or not. And diagnostics as well is going to be showing you what you receive in and out. Um, for the most part, though, if you're running a show and everything's hooked up, I would turn those back off because you don't you literally do not need all those fader all that all those fader moves logged in there but for diagnostics it is it is a very useful useful thing to see so that sort of wraps up our integration with osc widgets um, basically you can do most anything you would need to emulate an eos space panel um, keys faders buttons encoders uh, macros sort of the, the whole nine yards um, the next thing I'm going to segue over to and, and look at briefly is uh, some uh, Python examples. So just to uh, set it up here, um, the reason, so I, I've used this in uh, productions that I've worked on before, um, and the example is working on a, a dance recital. So let's say that I have a, uh, a dance studio and they have a number of different acts, a number of different uh, ages of, of dancers that are going to be coming in. And we're going to rehearse the show out of order. We have a bunch of different ones. And then during the uh, performances even, we're going to have a different order of, of acts, a different order of dances that are going to be happening. So this is an interesting challenge. And how, how I decided to tackle it is I created a cue list for each dance. So each, each dance event or each dance had their own cue list number. So I wrote them all out in a, a little spreadsheet or a little tab separated file, which is you can just open it up in a notepad kind of thing. I said, all right, cue list one is going to be the fourth grade hip hop. It's going to be the, the title of that is accountant. Um, and, you know, we had sort of a, a number of a number of different lists. And so I originally sat down with that and started typing into EOS and creating all these cue lists and things. And then I guess I got to realize I have a certain format that I like to lay out my queue list. I have sort of a starter template list. And it started to be a lot of work to copy the list over, write the name in correctly, and do all that. So I'm going to reopen my starter file here, so we're back to sort of a known state. Um, what I ended up doing is I ended up creating a starter file, which is a template queue list. So I set up my queues exactly the way I want just to get going. A mark queue, block assert, all fade flags, and like labels to start. And then as we tech each list, we drop in there, we create the list, and everything is isolated from each other. Where Python started to get in there is I started to think, well, it would be really nice if I lay all this out to import all that data in at once so that I don't have to label all this and type it into EOS. I have it in one place. I want to just drop it in and make it make it happen. So that is where we got with a, a simple Python library that does OSC, um, it connects to EOS, uh, reads the files, and it sends out some OSC commands. Just basically, hey, EOS new command, and then Q99 slash my template list, copy to Q, whatever list I just read in, enter. And then EOS set Q list label, again, another command from the manual, and um, add in the list number to label, and then add an argument for um, the label, which is both going to be the act name and the act description. So these are just things that I'll read in from the file. So if we see that in action, we're going to run fit my show, that Python 
going to pull out from the sample library the class act names.tsv. And we're going to run that. And boom, within five seconds, of course, amortized with all the development time to, to write that quick script. But within a few seconds, now I have the entire thing set up. And if we look over in EOS, we can see that EOS has just been processing a bunch of things, copying, setting labels, and all that. Um, but now I quickly have a template show, and I can get down to tech. I already have all those things in. I dump those in. Everything is great. So then I arrived at a different point where I said, you know, this is great, but now I need to link all these queues together. I need to say, all right, QList 54 is going to lead into QList 1, which is going to lead into QList 27, and I want to update those. And I don't think in QList numbers. I'm thinking in ACT numbers. Okay, the accountant number follows the doctor number, and the doctor number follows the astronaut number. And so what I did is I then laid out another list where I just said, all right, here is, according to the program, this is the list of all the, all the acts for Saturday at 3 p.m. So I wrote another script called stitchmyshow.python, and all it does is it reads in everything. Uh, it reads in the original class act name so it knows what's going on and what queue list number things assigned to. It reads an additional list that says this is the order, and it stitches it all together in EOS so that everything happens. So I just run the script, and I give it a couple files to think about the class act names and the Saturday 3 p.m., and now I hit go, and boom, it's sort of given me a little bit of output that I wrote in to say I'm going to have the pre-show list, talk to then the baker list, to the nurse list, and the dancer list, and all this adds up so that I can come in here, and I can open up a virtual face panel. I can take my opening queue list. I can load it. And now I can hit go, go, and now I'm just running through the queue list. Q list 5, Q list 28, Q list 11, Q list 3. And if we say, you know what, actually, Baker and Nurse, they're not going to be in for today. I'm going to update that list. I'm going to unload my list. I'm going to refire that. And now I'm going to load Q9, uh, Q997. We're going to go back to my face panel tab and load it. And we're going to hit go. And now we are hooked up to the next one is Dancer. The queue numbers are a little bit wonky there, but um, if we look, Dancer is Q list 11. Now I'm hooked up, I'm running Dancer, Astrologist, Dakota, whatever, um, and I'm just driving through my list. So this is sort of an example where OSC can make your life easier in sort of a very targeted way. You know, I didn't have a very complicated idea. I said, I have a list of names. I just want to just dump that data into EOS. I just want to quickly, I already have it here. I want to copy it in. And, you know, I have a list of act names. I just want to hook all these two lists up together. Um, so there's a lot of ways we can solve very specific problems with just a little bit of code um, and, and make that happen. Um, I will add, uh, so these scripts, there's nothing. Nothing secret in them. This is out on uh, on my GitHub page, um, and we can we can drop a link into that. Um, and you are welcome to to use it, modify it, use it as a starting point, whatever. Um, and this sort of just gives an example of a really quick way the script can read a file, make some changes, and then and then sync it into EOS. So that is that is sort of what I call Dance OSE. Uh, just a, a couple of quick scripts that help me in my in my design work. Um, this got me thinking, though. Um, so, ETC Labs has another project uh, on there called uh, EOS SyncLib. Uh, so it's a it's a library that one of the other EOS developers, uh, Chris Mizrak, wrote, and its whole purpose is over OSC to basically talk to EOS and get everything it can about a current show file. And the idea was you have basically this this simple thing that you could plug into any other application. And, and it, it basically represents all the data that EOS currently has. Um, so I took that and I made a little app called the EOS Hewlett Labeler. Um, so it's going to fly through here, get synced with EOS. And all it is is it talks to EOS and it presents with a simple list, just a simple list of uh, all my queue lists and labels. And with that, when I go into queue blind, I could say, all right, uh, accountant or maybe artist. I'm going to change that to opening number. 
type that in, boom. Behind the scenes, it's using the EOS sync library to take that change, send it back out. Uh, so it says, hey, set this queue list to the label opening number. Um, it sends that, and then EOS says, oh, by the way, since you told me you were interested in it, queue list two changed. So EOS says, oh, tell me more. And this is all happening behind the scenes in our library, where it just fetches that and then updates us to say, hey, this changed. So this is a, another example of just a quick way you can use some existing code. I didn't write the EOSync lib. I just plugged it in. And within about 100 lines of code of just basically kind of hooking up some pre some reusable components like QT and, and some C++ glue code, just got it up and running and was able to to make just sort of a another quick targeted thing that solves solves the problem for me. So um, sort of we sort of went to the went to the advanced level there, but kind of zooming back out, you know, like OSC is definitely a way where we can work from a simple button, uh, just a simple way to run a quick command. We can work our way up to saying I want to have like a little focus remote, I want to have a little bit of interactivity. We can get all the way out to say I have a specific problem. I need to talk to EOS data. I want to make some quick changes in a show file that would take me too long. And we can go even farther and, you know, make whole featured applications. You know, we can make, uh, you know, you can make something like LightWrite and then have it be talking in there. You can make something like OSC RFR or RRFR that, that just, you know, is basically a very dedicated feature rich uh, set of remotes and things like that. So the possibilities are endless. It's just sort of we have a, a rich library in EOS and a lot of uh, so we're sort of excited to see a lot of different ways that people end up using them. Yeah, and I, you know, to kind of capstone all of this, I think the whole point of us putting in and supporting OSC is exactly so that you have the ability to do these things with the console, right? We're we're very much aware that we're never going to have the time or the ability to give uh, everybody absolutely everything they're going to need from our software. And, and so having these OSC hooks under the surface um, allows you to, uh, as, as Hans just showed us, do some very specific task-oriented things or, or do full applications that interact with the system. So um, it's, it's very much uh, why, why we have that stuff. So um, if you're working on a project and you – have something that you can't do, don't hesitate to reach out for help. Um, as Hans mentioned as well, we're, we're constantly expanding and adjusting the library. Um, so forums are a great place to request new things. Um, again, our, our support team is uh, like uh, unrivaled in the industry with their ability to help you get through some stuff. And if we can't do it, we can look at it for future software. Um, so uh, there are a couple questions that came in, Hans, if you are interested in taking them. Always. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, uh, Ryan asked when you were back in the faders area, uh, is there a way to populate directs like kind of similar to how you were doing with the faders with, you know, kind of telling ghosts um, how you wanted to break down the banks? Um, does, does direct select do that as well? Yes, absolutely. And it works the same way. That's why I, I kind of had, I was going to do one or the other, and I sort of opted for the fader side. Um, but there is a whole section on uh, direct selects in the manual that goes over that. Um, it's sort of the same. The same way we're going to send slash EOS slash DS uh, with an index and target type, and you're going to say, hey, you know, I want a direct select, direct select bank number one is going to have 10 buttons. And EOS will then say, all right, great, here you go, and, and send you those those buttons back. I feel like I may have dropped out for a second there. No, you, we got you. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, and then you can – and really, I think the other part I didn't quite explain was the reason why you also do those banks – is so that you can page it, right? So if you tell me, oh, I have 10 of these in a button bank, or I have 100 of these in a button bank, then I can add paging buttons, and it'll give me the next 100, or the next five, or the next 25, whatever I've told it, it'll let me then page through everything that way. Right, so that the you're not trying to maintain all of the information all at once. It can break it up into chunks based on how the interface is laid out. Yep, exactly. Very cool, very cool. Um, for your your Python, your uh, show fix, uh, Matt was wondering which OSC library you were using for that. Uh, great question. I was using a library called um, Space Sensible OSC 
I think it's just called PyOSC. Uh, it is on my GitHub page still. I had a, a copy of that in there. And I, for today's session, I did a quick, a couple of quick updates in it to move it to Python 3 because there were a couple of changes that happened in it. Um, if you're running it, it's, it originally is a Python 2 script, but on my computer I'm running it to Python 3. Um, so yeah, that is on GitHub and you can, you can look there. And there are other libraries out there. It's just, uh, that have different feature capabilities and things. Uh, a second ago, I posted a link to your GitHub as well, Hans. So Sweet. everyone should be able to awesome. see that. Awesome. Thank you. And, and there's, uh, ETC Labs as well, which has, as Hans mentioned, a bunch of those projects as well. Yep. 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 For sure. Um, uh, Don asked a good question that I actually had to deal with on a project, uh, recently, which is what is the limit, uh, to the number of OSE commands that you can send to EOS in a second? Like, you know, when, when does it tip over and, 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 I'm interested actually to know your answer this time because um, I was I was told when I was doing this research for integration with a project um, that uh, that that it's a ton and and that uh, um, the concern was more that the sending device um, wouldn't be able to send it fast enough for how quickly we parse it. But you probably yeah. have a more exacting answer as to how all that gets handled. Sure. Well, I mean, some of it depends on what you're doing with OSC, right? Like the, the, the types of commands you're getting. If you're looking to synchronize and getting a whole bunch of data back, EOS is, is looking over in various places and grabbing random bits of data and sending it back to you um, versus, you know, sending like a bump button a bunch of times in a row. Um, for the most part, there is no practical limit and it kind of depends. It, it, a lot of, a lot of performance things is it, well, it depends, you know, what else, what else are you doing right now? Are you, are you doing, you know, 16,000 addresses of pixel mapping and, you know, visualizing and, you know, what else is EOS working on at the moment? Um, but the general idea is that EOS is going to queue everything up and it's going to bail out that OSC list as quickly as it possibly can. So, you know, you, you saw there um, with the, uh, the sync, the sync library application, you know, it was piling through queue lists and it, it did it in a couple seconds, but EOS is still pretty responsive and things. Um, because it's still prioritizing its phase engine, it's still prioritizing sending levels out. Because at the end of the day, that's really what we want to. That's really what we want to focus on. Um, so, no practical limit. Uh, you'll you'll know when you when you uh, hit it because it's it's it, you know it'll it'll slow down a little bit. But um, for the most part, um, it's you know you're you're fairly limitless. Um, I will say, like if you if you do notice things like that. A, let us know because we, you know, we, we want to hear about that kind of thing. Um, and also just, um, you know, you, you sort of want to consider like how you're structuring it at that point. Are you pulling versus um, pulling versus like, you know, just letting EOS synchronize with you so EOS can tell you about when things change versus checking it all the time. Or if you're doing a big sync, see if, you know, you find a good time to do that, you know, like uh, run the sync before the start of the show, don't run it in the middle of the fade of the show and those kind of things. So um, if you do run into those things, there are other ways you can kind of mitigate it and and work around it. But for the most part, it's not going to be it's not going to be a concern. Yeah, it's good to hear that we queue stuff up and just chew through the backlog as, as quickly as we can. So yep. um, cool. Uh, we had one that I've kind of been sorry. And thank you for being patient. This got asked very early in the session, but I thought it would kind yep. of be a good way to kind of uh, uh, wrap up. Um, which is uh, uh, they want to use uh, a, a color source console as a, a fader remote to EOS. So would you want to implement that via OSC or via ACN? Mm. And during ACN levels, right? I think that's a good little like thing to chat about. What what is? Yeah. Do you have a? Do you want to take a crack at it first, Hunter? Sure. sure. I would say. Um, this is actually a case where I would probably start by using streaming ACM tools, actually. Um, and the, the primary reason is for that same reason we talked about um, early on with UDP versus TCP. Because as a fader, that level is going to be coming out all the time. So, you know, Colors is going to set a fader to a level. I'm going to be able to listen to a streaming ACM address. And if I have a network hiccup, if I drop out, if I come back, I'm going to get another fader right away. Like, it's... it's it's 22, 22 millisecond uh, interval. I'm going to be able to catch up and get in sync with that. Um, so that would probably be my first place. OSC would probably work fine because um, I'm sure ColorSource has a you know a fader out um, command and I can wire that into EOS and you know whether that's with OSC router or whether we can map it to some kind of some kind of native command. 
But I would say, like, just the nature of a protocol that's, like, always sending, I'm always going to be up to date, even if I rejoin the network later, like, within, you know, a few milliseconds of receiving streaming ACN, my, my fader's back up and going. Yeah, and, and that was going to be my initial uh, response as well is, is ACN. Is it, you know, its intention is it's always streaming. So, like, um, so that's going to give you the best look. Uh, Soren did mention that uh, if he has, loses the ACN, the fader uh, drops to zero. Um, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you know, that, that, and that would be maybe a reason that you're concerned about that connection and you're concerned that the ACN isn't going to get there with regular intervals. Um, that that may be another reason for you to, um, to look at other protocols. So, yep. Um, and I think that might be, that might be a case where we can also look at improvements in the future. Uh, you know, we've, we've, there are other products that solve that problem with like hold last look behavior and that kind of thing. And so EOS doesn't have anything like that right now, but that might be, might be something we can, we can look at in the future. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the idea that, um, uh, uh, certain drastic changes in a certain time period could be, dealt with in a specific way or something like that. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, good. Well, that actually takes us right up to about time. It uh, looks like we've got uh, our questions answered. So, first of all, a huge thank you to Han. That was incredible. Um, a, a great dive. Um, I felt like it was really approachable, so I hope our, our audience did too. So, thank you again for um, coming and, and being the expert. So. It was my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for Thanks for having me. It was, it was great to, uh, yeah, answer questions, show off some cool OSC, and yeah. yeah, excited to see what see what ideas ideas come. So yeah, yeah, and then, you know, this is something that I think um, we've we've talked for a long time about, like not just better documentation, but maybe for the world starts to get back to something uh, uh, that looks a little more normal. That maybe there could be workshops or things like that. Um, so if you're interested, again, don't hesitate to reach out to us on social media or, or email me or Rob directly. Um, you know, we. If you're interested in this stuff, we want to make sure that you have resources to, to dig in. So, um, so right. Uh, um, I have one, one closing thought. I noticed a question came in asking about code and, and things. Um, the C++ application that I had isn't currently on GitHub, but I intend to post it. I have to detangle it from some EOS things before I can, before I can put it up, but it will be, it'll be up later today. Great, thank you, and thank you for sharing that. That's a great thing for people to to dig into. Um, so good. Well, again, thank you all for joining us. If you all have anything else, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, stay well, everybody, and uh, yeah, we'll chat with you soon. And thank you, Rob, as always. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Tom. Bye, everybody. Bye.